I'm Donna. And I'm Carrie. And we are a Paranormal Chicks. Episode 109. And we are damn fine. We're back to rhyming. I mean, kicking it old school. Mm-hmm. And let me just start off by saying, we see y'all, you reviewed, you tweeted, you did a lot of things. Thank y'all, thank y'all, thank y'all. It really means a lot to us. It's like the opposite of you asked, we answered. We asked, you answered. Right, yeah, and y'all did it. Came in clutch. Yes. We also have some new Patreoners that came in clutch. Yes, we do. Thank you so much, Nikki B. from Texas. Tammy G. from Texas. Danielle F. from Minnesota. Melissa G. from California. Autumn S. from North Carolina. And Summer B. from Indiana. Thank y'all so much for joining Patreon. If you want an episode shout out or any of the bonus content, like a bonus episode every month, an I Survived episode, a Milk Carton Mini, where we cover a missing persons case, a bloopers. Bloops. I, why I said a bloopers makes no sense. <laughs> That's why we have bloopers. Still better than bloops. Mm. Stop trying to make fetch happen. Mm. And just extra slices, which are tidbits that were too long, like this, to make it into the episode. Yep. So if you want it, head on over to patreon.com slash the APC podcast and peruse around at the tiers. Hey, extra content for your quarantine. You're damn right. You know what we finally did yesterday when we were procrastinating recording a Sinister Sightings? We finally put up all of the cards that we have gotten and our second board is almost full. I love the like hodgepodge of like Christmas cards, 100th episode, birthday, like just thinking of you type cards. Like I love looking at these cards that are handmade, that are bought, that are postcards, that are all the things. Like thank y'all so much for sending in these cards to us because they truly matter to us. We open and read every single one of them and we have sound panels that kind of double as like a cork board for us that we hang them all up on. And also uh, other podcasts. Yeah, we have podcast stickers from like The Haunted Heart, Golden Ghouls, Southern Gothic, Spellcast. So check out some of our podcast friends. Yeah, I think it's awesome that we all support each other. Absolutely. Oh, so speaking of podcasts, I started one today and it's called Somebody. I think it was like a drop on Helen Gone, one of the other podcasts I listened to. Mm -hmm. And it was like introducing somebody. Yeah. I'm like, who's somebody? Well, it's about this guy named Courtney and he was shot and he dies. It's a podcast by his mom. Oh, shit. And she doesn't feel like the investigation is really moving along. And so she does her own kind of investigation and stuff. I only got to like two episodes or so, but it's pretty interesting. And they're from Chicago, and uh, one of his friends is Chance the Rapper. Okay. Yeah, I was like... I don't know who that is. Oh, my God. (laughs) Good Lord. (laughs) You thought I did for a second. I really did. Well, who doesn't know who Chance the Rapper is? Carrie, that too. Slowly raise his hand. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, wow. Remember last episode when you're like, I'm cool, I'm with it, I can tell my nephews. Don't. Your card is revoked. I just got it. (laughs) You can't handle the card. But I plan on finishing that podcast, so it's something, again, we're all quarantined and another podcast to pass the time. And, you know, justice for her kid. Oh, yeah, that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So this week, I'm doing the story of this beautiful lady. She was from Egypt and she immigrated to the States. Her name is Omaima Nelson. Obvi married name. Omaima was born, like I said, in Egypt, but in South Egypt, right along the border with Sudan. Omaima was Muslim and she was raised in basically the farmland in Southern Egypt. But she was raised with kind of the darker side of of that very traditional Muslim culture that's the more... Extreme? Yes, yes. Because again, just like with any religion, with any anything, 
when you take it to the extremes, it's bad. Yeah. Growing up, her father was very abusive, both physically, verbally, even sexually. Oh, gosh. She had a very, very tough upbringing. But to make matters worse, when she was in her teens, she actually went through genital mutilation. Oh, gosh. Or as they say, female circumcision. Which, I don't agree with that being called that. Female circumcision. It's not like just a little snip of the foreskin. And, I mean, whether you believe in circumcision or not on an infant, that's not the thing here. But, like, this is not, like, oh, here's, like, for hygiene. No, this is, you are removing the clitoris to make sex painful. Not only not pleasurable, fucking painful. Yeah. So, FYI, if you didn't know what the genital mutilation and or female circumcision is, that's what it is. It's fucking removing the clitoris so that... A woman has zero pleasure with sex. And again, I know I've literally just said this sentence, but it actually makes sex quite painful. Yeah. I did a report on it in high school. Like, of course I did. Yeah, not surprised. That's why I just, like, glazed over it. Mm-hmm. And with some, I guess, cultures, not that I'm an expert on it, but if a woman has had premarital sex, it's often the punishment for it. And... While I think, I don't want to put words in Omaima's mouth, I think that she had had sex, like consensual sex, aside from the fucking sexual assault from her father, which is what led to the genital mutilation. But even in extreme cases, when it is the family who abused them, they still will perform the genital mutilation because they're no longer a virgin. Right. If you've never heard of it, it's it's really quite barbaric and oppressive and... It still goes on. Fucking horrible. So that's just a snapshot into Omaima's life growing up. I do want to say, so two things about, like, the references that I used throughout this. I used this thing called Medium.com, like the true crime part that was actually really great. I also used a really cool YouTube video. It was called The True Crime Case. Well, I'm not going to read you the whole title, actually, because it'll give stuff away. But of Omaima Nelson. And the girl that does it, Gorgie Locks, she is actually Egyptian Muslim as well. But it was just really interesting to hear her. I mean, even at the beginning, she talked about, one, how everybody butchers the pronunciation and I still probably am in my, with my accent and all. Like, I really tried, like, so many times. I was like, okay. Even wrote it out phonetically. Like, I, like, would listen to her say it, rewind. Listen to her say it, rewind. Listen to her say it, rewind. And just talking about how, like, in the Muslim culture, like, you, they believe that God, you like, you've been named before you're even born by God. And so how important it is that her name is said correctly. And, you know, and then just to go into the cultural background and where she's from in Egypt and all that and, like, how it pertains to the story. I don't know. It was really cool. She gives insight that other people can. Right. And I can say it all day long, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean nearly as much coming from me as it would her because that's her culture. Exactly. When Amima was about around 18, Amima's mom left her father, again, who was incredibly abusive we hate him absolutely well they moved to cairo but they moved to the slums of cairo and this place was actually called the city of the dead because it was basically a bunch of shacks surrounded by tombs kind of sounds amazing but also kind of sounds terrifying but also i don't want to live in a shack no And I don't want to live by tombs either. I mean, I got a shack a lot when I played MASH growing up, but uh, (laughs) didn't mean I want to. Right. So bless their hearts. Again, you know, they've left a terrible situation for a bad situation. But they've also left everything behind, too. I mean, as far as money and, you know, everything to make ends meet. Well, I know I said this at the beginning, but Omaima was gorgeous. 
so Amima used what she had because she didn't have money. She didn't, you know, the girl got to eat, literally. She eventually met this American who was there working in the oil industry. Let me say that for people who don't speak Southern oil. <laughs> I just realized I totally said it. I mean, exactly how I say it, but nobody probably knows what I'm talking about. So oil here to be known as oil. Omaima had that je ne sais quoi. Like, she just had that it factor that made men fall for her very quickly. So, her mom was like, you need to marry him. Like, now. He's American. He's got money. You know, you can go to America with him when his job's done. All the things, like, wrap that up. So, she did. They actually married very quickly. Like, weeks. I'm telling you, the girls got the it factor. Eventually, his job did end, and it was time for him to go back home, and he lived in Texas. Imagine that, oil and gas, he lived in Texas, so she got to go with him. Once they got to America, the newness wore off, the honeymoon phase was over, back to real life. She was in a country that she obviously didn't know. She spoke a little bit of English, but she didn't speak English very well, and so... It was very difficult for her to communicate and, you know, all the things. Not long after they got back to the States, the marriage ended. What is this, 90 Day Fiance? Uh, Basically. Okay. So she's poor again, much like she was back when she was living in Cairo. But again, here, doesn't speak the language well and is in a foreign country. I have to say... People who can just up and move to a foreign country, not speaking the language and all of that, like, you have some balls on you the size of fucking Texas. Right. Because um, that's, like, some fucking guts. I know. That gives me anxiety just thinking about it. It gives me anxiety thinking about moving to a big city in the States. I really do get anxiety even thinking about traveling to other countries that... I don't speak the language. That's just traveling, much less Mm -hmm. fucking moving there. In order to get money to eat, Omaima would, she did a lot of like petty theft type things. But she also, it said that she had a bunch of different boyfriends that, so she would get involved with them, use whatever, can I get a bottle of her pheromones, please? Because (laughs) this girl had it. She would get these men to, like, fall in love with her basically instantly. Yeah. And she would spend all their money. Maybe not all of it. But she would spend a lot of their money. And then when they were like, uh, uh, wait, hang on. Or she just got bored. She'd move on, take some more money, and move on to the next person. Dang. She was very much like a sugar baby to a sugar daddy. She always went after older men who had money. But she kind of, to me, wasn't like... How you think of, like, a traditional, like, someone who's just truly a sugar baby. Why? I think because the men didn't necessarily know that that's what was going on. You know what I mean? Like, in, like, a traditional, like, sugar daddy, sugar baby relationship. Yeah. Like, everybody knows where everybody stands. It's an arrangement. It's whether it's just for companionship. There's a sexual relationship. with You know. Yeah. It's a mentorship. Whatever. You know, it's. It's an agreed upon relationship. And I think in her case, she was taking advantage of men. Well, depending on what these men look like and how rich they were and how young, like how big of the age difference, uh, they knew the situation. Yes, but. Because let's just. But you know that people can turn on charms and trick people. So it's like if she really was able to turn on the charms and. They truly believed that she loved them, too. I mean, if they really did develop feelings and all these things, they may not have realized. They may, you know, and it's like, well, you dumb because, hello, what do you think it was? But on the other hand, they believed her, you know? Eventually, she turned to jobs that was what she knew just from her upbringing and the type of work that she had done back in Egypt. She started working as like a housekeeper, a nanny, you know, doing some of those types of jobs to get by too. 
really kind of in between the men, mostly. By the fall of 1991, Omaima had made her way from Texas all the way to Orange County, California. Omaima was in a bar, and she sees this guy who's, like, super flashy. Like, has a wad of cash, drives a red Corvette, has red cowboy boots, this huge belt buckle, like... I don't know, but all I'm picturing is like Burt Reynolds in striptease. This guy was bragging about how much money he had. Again, had the big wad of cash. Was talking about how he had all this land in Texas. Don't even make a joke about his wife. <laughs> I was going to say I had a big wad of cash. Small. Oh. Yeah, tiny living space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Had a lot of room in that pocket. Yeah, I was going to say, the gentleman doth protest too much. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. At the time, Omaima was 23, and this flashy cowboy was 56, and his name... Can you just call him the rhinestone cowboy? I sure can. Okay, thank you. And the rhinestone cowboy was 56 years old, and his name was Bill Nelson. So the two knew each other like two weeks before they got married. I mean, they say when you know, you know. But uh, what he didn't say was that um, he's still legally married back in Texas. But they got married anyway, whatever that means. So wait, legally her name isn't then Nelson. Well, I mean, you could change your name to whatever. Oh, okay. I mean, think about like... Like sister wives, like the Browns, you know, like yeah. on TLC. I mean, they're, they're all of their last names Brown, but Robin's the only one that's like legally married to Cody. Oh, okay. Mary was, but she got divorced so that Robin could marry him legally so that he could adopt Robin's kids. Okay. Yes, I love that show. After they got married, Bill took Amima on a road trip just to go through Texas and Arkansas, meet all of his relatives. And, of course, they were like, Skirt! Uh, she young. And, like, younger than some of your kids. Which, no shade. Right. You want, you know, you like the daddy-daughter thing? You like older men, younger women? Older women, younger men? I don't give a fuck. But his family was like, what? Mm Mm-hmm. This was kind of like a, really? Story. But, so she won his family over. They were all horseback riding. And Omaima's horse threw her, well, from the horse. And her response was, Can, just give me some aspirin and vodka. And so the family was like, oh, shit, this bitch is tough. Dang. Meanwhile, I'm like, yeah. I mean, do you know her at all? Because, I mean, obviously she's not going to, like, spill the beans about her whole right. life story. But it's like. The bitch spent her teens in a slum in Cairo. Yeah. And then before that, her dad was the fucking devil reincarnate. Right. So uh, she's going to be good being thrown from a horse. Mm Mm-hmm. So flash to Thanksgiving Day, 1991. It's been just a couple of months since Bill and Omaima got married. That morning, Bill talked on the phone with his daughter, Margaret. And he's like, you know, everything's good. We're going to have dinner later. You're more than welcome to come. And she's like, no, you know, I got other things to do. Can't come. Well, flash forward three days. And there's a guy named Jose Esquivel. And he's sleeping at his house. And he is woken up by this banging on his door. And he is like, the fuck? It is too early. Don't fuck with my sleep. Who (laughs) is this? Looks outside and... It's black-eyed kids. No, that's your story. Okay, okay, sorry. He sees a red Corvette. Well, Jose didn't recognize the car, so he was like, I'm not fucking answering that door. So whoever was there just left. Well, that afternoon at about 1 o'clock, the red Corvette comes back. And this time, he opens the door, and he's like, what the fuck? Like, who is this? Well, when he opens the door, he sees Omaima. And he had dated Omaima over a year ago, it was a very short relationship, so he's like, the fuck is she doing here? Well, when he, like, processes everything, he sees that she's, like, bawling, crying. She's got cuts on her face, cuts on her hand. He's like, what the fuck is going on? And she says, my husband 
like, lost it. He raped me, he attacked me, and I had to fight back, and I killed him. Oh, shit. So then she says, what else is the girl to do? I cut up the body. Oh, gosh. I I was about to say, and then I cut up the body. Yeah. Mm. Can you you help me get rid of it? I'll give you 75 grand and two motorcycles. Wow. So Jose's like, deep boop, 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 boop. Carol Baskins, we need your help. Pretty much. No, he's like, okay, all right, Amama, you go home. Let me go get a truck so that I can help you get rid of the body. I'll be there in just a minute. And so she's like, cool, cool, cool. She goes home. Then he goes, dee doo boop, 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 uh, police. Uh-huh. This bitch showed up at my doorstep. Help. You know? Yeah. Because, what the fuck? Right. Like, believable, believable. Oh, but, oh, wait. You chopped up his body parts after mm-hmm. that. No. Mm-mm. Yeah. So the police end up, like, pulling her over in Bill's car, in the Corvette. And how about this? In the fucking passenger seat, trash bags. Oh, my gosh. So inside the trash bags, they find mm, human organs, including, listen to this fucking shade that this article fucking threw. Okay. Lungs. With black spots from smoking <laughs> cigarettes. Damn. I mean, call a brother out. I mean. <laughs> Damn. What the fuck? He dead. You don't have to throw shade at him from smoking. <laughs> what is this? A truth commercial? I was about to say, let's just put it in a stop smoking ad right here. Where's the little rat smoking? Whatever, right? whatever he is. Oh, my God. It would only be better if they pulled her over for using the HOV lane. Donna. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> I mean, technically. I got spotty lungs over here. <laughs> oh, God, we're going to hell. We're going to hell. <laughs> so when police are like, oh, um, what you uh, what you got going on over here? She's like, well, so Bill killed somebody and these are their lungs. And she's like, he's on a business trip. So the police are like, deep boop, 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 judge, can we get a warrant? And so they search their apartment. So when the police get there, they found a bunch of different boxes with, like, computer parts and stuff in them. Because Bill used to be a pilot. Well, he's still a pilot, but he had gotten in trouble because he was using his helicopter to fly pot back and forth from Mexico. Hmm. And he got busted. As one does. And so he had some jail time and all the things. So he was a felon. So he was earning money now, like, fixing computers and stuff. Well, so the police are, like, looking at all these boxes. Dispersed through the boxes were suitcases. And inside the suitcases were trash bags. And inside the trash bags were Bill's body parts. Mm. They found a lamp that was broken and an iron, like, you know, iron your clothes, that had some, like, human hair on it. Ooh. So it's like, it's looking like maybe she whopped him upside the head. <laughs> whopped. With a lamp and an iron. Then they got to the bedroom. And... All the bedposts were broken. Damn. The mattress was soaked in blood. So then the police go to the bathroom. When they get in there, they see some clothes hangers. On the clothes hangers is Bill's disemboweled torso. Ooh. Yeah. Then they go to the kitchen. They find a deep fryer. Oh. Inside was turkey meat. Ooh. And Bill's hands. Ooh. Extra crispy. Original recipe. We fucking nasty. Y'all, I'm sorry. Don't unsubscribe. Okay. Then, in the trash, they found pieces from a hip. But don't forget, it was Thanksgiving. So there was some cranberry sauce and some turkey. And for the record, when I was on the website that was talking about the cranberry sauce and stuff... There were fucking ads for cranberry sauce. <laughs> I was like, damn, at that ad placement. So then they moved to the freezer. 
and they found Bill's head wrapped in tinfoil. But here's the kicker. The eyes were missing. No. His head had been deep fried. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, Omaima is at the police station. She's telling all kind of different stories. Shit keeps changing. She's going from he's still alive to, (laughs) like, a demon made her do it. To, I mean, like, literally, to what she told Jose. He raped her. It was self-defense. Like, like her story kept changing. But they did do their due diligence. They took her to a hospital, had a rape kit done. There were no signs of sexual trauma. I will say this, mm. though. I mean, this may sound very ignorant and maybe inappropriate, but can you really tell that on someone who's got such that's what I was trauma thinking. i mean that's that's icky that's you know what i mean like it's that feels like a like a ugh, i don't know i don't know maybe you can i guess maybe they can tell the newness of it yeah if you remember she had all those cuts on her face and her hands she also had some on her breasts but they said that those were not consistent with defensive wounds those were self-inflicted? No, that's where I thought they were going too. No, those are injuries that they said that would be consistent with her like trying to cut up this body. Oh. Yeah. So now the medical examiner is trying to put Bill together. So I told you that his head was in the freezer, so he's decapitated. He was his torso was found disemboweled. His hand yes. deep fried. Yes. Is it sad that I was like, why is his head in tinfoil? But then when you said it was deep fried, I was like, oh, well, that makes sense. Like, and not in a trash bag, you know? Like, yeah. But it doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. But I see what you're thinking, you know? Yeah. I'm like, oh, leftovers. But um, no. Like, no Jeffrey Dahmer. Mm-hmm. Well, she also castrated him. <sighs> Shit. And to me, that is such... A tell of mm-hmm. all the trauma that she's been in. Well, I'll get into that later. So what they found was he had multiple blunt force traumas to the head. He also had ligature marks around his ankles. So he had been tied up. And since all four mm-hmm. of the posts were broken, it stands to reason that his wrist and ankles were tied up. But with his hands being removed, you there's no way to know. Yeah. Well, here's... The other kicker, about 100 pounds of bill was missing. One of their neighbors said that the garbage disposal basically ran constantly for two days. Oh, fuck. And that it started Thanksgiving evening and, you know, again, ran for like two days. Well, they did some psychological tests with Omaima. And so, okay, so she had an interview with a court-appointed psychologist And she told this psychologist that she cooked Bill's ribs in barbecue sauce Mm. and ate them. Mm. And, quote, it was so sweet. Nothing was sweeter. Oh. Oh, gosh. Uh Uh-huh. Well, later, she recanted. So... That psychologist ended up diagnosing her as psychotic and having PTSD. So that's kind of where I was going to go back to. I don't know what made her kill Bill. Movie. But I kind of can see like all of this built up trauma and whatever is the catalyst for her hitting him over the head to kill him beats me. Did he attack her? I don't know. Did he just not like her Thanksgiving cooking? I don't fucking know. There's literally never going to be an answer for that. But it's almost like once she did it, it like unleashed this fury of pent up aggression and trauma from all the things that she'd experienced. And she took it all out on his body. Yeah. You know who that reminds me of? Not the taking out on the body, but... How we think like something happened and then that triggered it is 
Eileen Warnos. I thought that's where you're going to go. Yeah. Well, but here's the thing. So, okay, in December of 92, she finally went, this is about a year later, she went to trial for the murder. Because she's saying, yeah, I did it, but, you know, uh, psychotic, PTSD, he attacked me, all the things, you know. But before she met Bill, she dated a guy named Robert Hansen. And Robert Hansen was... Basically, the slam dunk for the prosecution, because around the time that Omaima had basically gotten tired of him, she tied him up in a chair and robbed him at gunpoint. Oh, shit. Yeah. So, the prosecution was like, um, stands to reason, this is her pattern. Mm-hmm. She tricked Bill into a bondage session tied him up on the bed and then some say that when she was like give me all the money he was like absolutely not she fucking beat him and then stabbed him with scissors oh shit so of course like i said her her defense was all about her childhood trauma her ptsd they said that bill had been abusive to her both physically and sexually there was nothing to back that up. Granted, they had only been married for four fucking weeks. Right. But there was no there was no paper trail of like hospital visits or anything like that to support her claims of being abused. She said that Bill held her basically captive for days, repeatedly raping her while she was held captive. And that she had finally gotten free just one arm when she was able to grab the lamp and hit him and then stab him with the scissors. She says that she doesn't remember dismembering him. That's a lot. Uh Uh-huh. And it's not like she just, like, dismembered him in the bathtub and it's, like, crazy. Like, she cooked some parts, Mm -hmm. you know, and, like, stored them in different areas, had, you know, his fucking torso hanging up like a suit jacket. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it took the jury six days. They acquitted her of first-degree murder, but they did find her guilty of second-degree murder and for the assault on Robert Hansen. So she ended up getting 28 years to life. They didn't get her for, like, desecration of a corpse or anything? I guess not. Okay. So she was up for parole in 2006. And they were like, absolutely not. She's, un- quote, unpredictable and a serious threat to public safety. Well, then after that, she started a prison romance. Well, not really a prison romance. A long-distance romance with a guy outside of jail. And he was in his 70s and disabled. But they got married. And she got to have conjugal visits with him. And then he passed away. And now she got all his money. Damn. Uh Uh-huh. So, it's like, even from behind bars, that bitch still got it. That's crazy. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, in 2011, she went back up for parole. It was a a five-and-a-half-hour hearing on her parole. She says, quote, I swear to God I did not eat any part of him. I am not a monster. And she just talked about how she looked for love in all the wrong places, but now she has a strong desire to help others. Those are her quotes of her. But when the parole commissioner says, what was the purpose in cooking him? She would not answer. Really? So they denied her parole, and she's eligible for parole again in 2026. Dang. So what do you think? She eat him or no? I don't know. I feel like probably not. But why wouldn't she have answered that question? I mean, maybe she would have. She just didn't. But why? I don't know. Maybe she just doesn't like fresh food. Okay. It says a girl who likes to keep things out to make them stale. Just Cheetos. But I think that, like, if she really didn't eat him, when they asked her, well, then why'd you fry him? Like, literally, why did you cook him? She wouldn't have just refused to answer. She would have said, I I don't know. Like, I don't, you know, I don't know why 
I don't remember dismember. I don't remember that process or whatever. You know, she would have had some answer. But for her to just be like, I'm not fucking answering that. Yeah. Like refuse to answer. That's sketch. Yeah. But also that's so out of left field. All of a sudden she's a fucking cannibal. So honestly, I don't fucking know. I don't either. I just feel like. I I think. Although I just said I don't fucking know. This dawned on me. Maybe she didn't eat him. But all the cooking and all of that was really trying to figure out ways to dispose of the body. I mean, she was really trying to get rid of the fucking evidence, I think. Yeah. And so she was like, well, let me see if I cook him. Can I then put him down the garbage disposal and it'll go better or whatever? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Might not smell as bad if it's like fried and not, you know, like, I mean, I feel like melted flesh would smell just as bad, but... You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I I don't either. And then she thought, well, let me put it in the freezer so maybe it'll freeze. And I mean, we're trying to put logic uh, to an illogical situation. Yeah. But, I mean, I know I said this, but damn, that girl still got it, though. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, in prison, she's still manipulating and getting what she wants. You know, it's Mm -hmm. like. If you can figure out what that charm is, what that, like, it factor that some people just have, man, you would rule the world. You ready for yours? Mine is nowhere near that. Oh, shit. So, we are going from someone who might have had a psychotic break to a psychiatric hospital. The Eloise Psychiatric Hospital, located in Westland, Michigan, to be exact. Okay. Oh, you know I love psychiatric hospitals like that. Mm-hmm. That was one of my favorite seasons of American Horror Story. Mm, same. It didn't start out as a hospital, though. It was intended to be a poorhouse and a farm in what was Wayne County. And a poorhouse is just what it sounds like. It's a government-run place that people can live and work in order to have support and housing. And those people are often, you know... Poor, needy, or were dependent due to mental or physical disabilities. So it was called the Wayne County Poorhouse, and it was built in 1839. So the county paid 800 bucks for 160 acres. Holy bejesus. Mm-hmm. And it included a log cabin that was known as the Black Horse Tavern. So this is right where they built the poorhouse. Like, they added on to the tavern. And the tavern is what they used as a residence for the keeper and his wife. I bet that land would cost, like, $8 million now. You know, that much fucking land. About that. So at first, there were 35 residents. And a lot of the people didn't want to be transferred to this poorhouse from the other ones Because they said it's basically out in the middle of nowhere. And they weren't lying because it was in the country and it's 160 acres. Mm -hmm. I think it was like a two-day travel to get anywhere, you know? Oh, that sounds terrible. Mm -hmm. But it was because they were hidden away from society because, hello, that's what the county wanted. Because the poor people were usually... The criminals or the town drunks or whatever, you know, the blemishes of their society. Fuck them. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's go hide you out in the woods because we don't want to deal with you. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, eventually it encompassed more stuff like an asylum and a hospital because, of course, poor turns into criminals and criminals into mentally ill, etc., By 1913, there were three divisions. The Eloise Hospital, which was the mental hospital. Although I do love the name Eloise. (laughs) It's so cute for a little girl, Mm -hmm. but it would be, it's also like so cute for a grandma. Yeah. The Eloise Infirmary, which was the poorhouse, and the Eloise Sanatorium, which was the tuberculosis hospital. And they were all collectively known as Eloise. And it was named after the Detroit's postmaster's only child, his daughter, Eloise Dickerson. As usual, with asylums and such back in the day, people didn't understand that there were different levels of mental illness. It was more like 
if you're considered mentally ill, you're a danger to society and to yourself. And there's this county report from the 1840s that talks about the use of chain restraints to separate the mentally ill from the other quote unquote inmates. What? Mm hmm. And also, they kept the mentally ill, you know, who were chained up, housed on the upper floor of the farm, which is where they also kept the pigs. This is not my only takeaway from that, but is that normal to keep pigs on the upper floor? No idea. I mean, I don't feel like it is. Do they, I mean, I know what Bo looks like trying to go upstairs, and he's <laughs> essentially a little pig. <laughs> so, how they got him up there? Uh, probably a ramp. They probably didn't do stairs a lot. It was all just like ramps. What? Bo doesn't do ramps either. Well, he's special. He's my dog. I know. He's very clumsy. Yes. My other takeaway, though, is mm-hmm. you're going to keep humans with pigs. Mm-hmm. Chained up. Even just the way in which they categorized these people. Like, it may, like it's like they're in the poorhouse and they don't put people first. This is not person first language. The mentally ill people mm-hmm. and the this people and the that people and the, okay, well, how about they're all people? Right. And let's be honest. Some of the people who are mentally ill, quote unquote, probably have like postpartum depression or yeah. probably have have been through some sort of trauma and it's completely a normal reaction mm-hmm. and they're like, oh, mentally ill. Or... Just uh, their neighbor wanted to buy their land. Uh-huh. And so they were like, oh. Exactly. Oh, uh, Billy Joe down the street, he cray. Mm-hmm. So uh, come get him. Oh, by the way, can I have his land? Exactly. <sighs> Am I going to get mad this whole episode? No. Okay, good. Question mark? So I'll just stay on the soapbox? Mm-hmm. Okay. Biddy Hughes is on record as being... Eloise's first official patient with a mental illness in 1841. And she was committed by her family when she was in her mid-30s. And she was kept there until she died 58 years later. Why? Because she was single and didn't want to get married? Why? Because she was a lesbian? Why? Because she got her period? Why? Because she breathed and she was a girl and they didn't want her anymore? Who knows? (laughs) Probably tick all of those boxes. Okay, I'll sit down on my. <laughs> I'll, I'll sit down on my soapbox. I'll, I'm not going to stand mm-hmm. up anymore. Sorry, but just think about her being labeled mentally ill, and her being chained up there with the pigs. Mm-hmm. And she's thirty, mm-hmm. and she was there for how long? Did you say fifty eight years? years later? Uh-huh. That woman had like the longest lifespan of anybody in that fucking century, and she spent it all fucking chained to a bed. Because mm-hmm. that's a long ass lifespan back in the day. Yeah. There is this county employee, and his name is Stanislaus Keenan, and he wrote a book in 1913, and it was called The History of Eloise. And what he wrote in this book, uh, he said that in the first few years, people who were in the surrounding area heard, quote, the chained unfortunates roaring and shrieking in discord with the squealing pigs beneath. Wait, so the pigs were below them? I, that's what it said, but it said on the other thing that it, they were up on the second level with the pigs. Maybe they were up on the second level, like, with the pigs, as in, in the same, like, barn. Maybe. Maybe we're being very concrete and it's not <laughs> that concrete. You know what I mean? Or maybe these people had no idea because they never went and checked on the people. That's probably true, too. So, they have no fucking clue. Either way, it's fucked up. Well, the conditions improved in 1869 when the quote-unquote mentally ill were moved to a new building, and they were then supervised by a neighboring farmer and his wife. However, the chains were not removed until 1881. Holy shit. Well, in the 1930s, Wayne County as a whole began to feel the effects of the Depression. So, in turn, Eloise grew because now there's more poor people and more, quote-unquote, mentally ill people because of the Depression. So, in 1932, there was another building 
that was to house unemployed men. And then by 1934, the population was more than 8,300, which about 50% were quote unquote mentally ill. And the employees were around 2,000. Oh, shit. Mm-hmm. Well, they really had nothing to do. The employees or the residents? No, the employees had plenty to do. I was going to say, that's like over six to one. Yeah, they had plenty to do. The residents. And so that meant that the employees had way more to do. So boredom was a huge problem. There's a news article from 1939, and it had like their daily routine This is what it was quoted. The residents rise at 7 a.m. and go to bed at 7.30 p.m. Between times, they sit and stare at the wall, at their feet, at the windows. There is no exercise or organized social movement. I like, I'm fucking speechless. Right? So what happens next? They fucking act out because they're bored, they're not stimulated, and so Mm -hmm. they stimulate themselves the only way they can. Mm Mm-hmm. And then they get in trouble, and then it creates more work for the employees, which then makes them fucking chain them up. Yeah. Yep. So this kind of led to some of the quote-unquote inmates to receive, like, a hall pass to go off campus. They got to go into the neighboring towns. However, people knew who they were because Mm -hmm. they looked different, Mm -hmm. you know. They were easy targets for police, and so they would arrest them and then fine them for some kind of petty crime or some kind of bullshit thing, and then, like, the cycle would start all over again, you know, and it's just, oh. A lot of them said that the outside world was too difficult to cope with, and so if they did get off the grounds, they were, like, overstimulated And so they would just go to the local bars and those people who were like alcoholics or whatever would end up at the bars, drink, end up in jail, Mm -hmm. you know. And then others, this pain my heart, said others would just walk around the surrounding neighborhoods aimlessly. So dangerous for the neighbors, like the neighborhoods and that person. But here's the thing. Is that them walking around aimlessly in those neighborhoods gave them more purpose than they had the whole time they were wherever the fuck they were with Mm -hmm. Eloise. Yeah. But how scary. Like, I mean, just think about if we knew someone who had a past but was just walking up and down the streets, we would be on high alert. Mm -hmm. Which was probably not actually dangerous. Like, it's scary, but it probably wasn't actually dangerous for the neighborhoods. But it was really dangerous for the person walking. Definitely. But I say it's dangerous for the neighborhoods because the people in the – like, the neighbors. Because when people are scared, they do crazy shit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, ugh. Our system is just so fucked up. Like, and it has been, and it's no better. It's, like, once someone is in said system, whatever it may be, from mental illness or criminal or whatever, it's it, there's it's like there's no getting out. Mm-hmm. But things kept growing, and eventually the Eloise grew into basically a self-sustaining city. It had 75 buildings. Holy shit. Included a fire department. It had their own police department. It had a bakery, a cemetery, had on-site laundry, library. That was something to help them have something to do. Thank God. Mm Mm-hmm. And then they also had low-rent employee Building So nearly 20% of the staff lived on the grounds. And now that hundred and like eight, whatever acres I said, it's now 902 acres. Holy shit. Yeah. So around this time, their treatment, it was changing with the times too. 
So they did hydrotherapy, sensory deprivation, twirling chairs, which reminded me of your OT stuff. I don't know if it's the same thing, but when you were like having to spin around. That sounds amazing. Yeah, I was like, maybe. But then this, I was like, "Mm, this doesn't sound good. Needle cabinets. What? They're literally steel cabinets, which you would lock a patient in. So like a locker, picture a football locker, because they then have like holes in it because they insert needles into the patient to put water directly in their skin. What? Yeah, what? I don't understand why. I'm not a medical person. And uh, I wasn't going to look it up because I don't want to see any pictures because I don't like needles. That sounds like something Jigsaw would do. It, it really does. Yes. Like, mm. I don't mind needles, but uh, that's dumb. Oh. Why do you need water in your skin? <laughs> I don't know. Like, what the fuck is that going to do for a fake il- mental illness? I don't know. I don't know. And I'm sure that some of the people who live there did have a real mental illness. Oh, for sure. But Mm -hmm. probably not all of them. Definitely not all of them. Well, then eventually shock therapy became a common practice. And then also lobotomies, of course. Of course. Mm -hmm. Because those work. But then, like I said, they just kept changing and kept evolving and then they started to provide occupational and recreational therapy thank god what year because that is way behind the times i don't know a year because ot it, started it wasn't behind the times it was one of like the oh, okay, first okay, okay. their occupational therapy it included sewing working in the hospital laundry and farming and then the recreational therapy had like music therapy. I feel like every time I say something like positive, there's a negative, Mm -hmm. you know, to it. So there's still that ugly underbelly throughout this like huge boom. And it's like the complex was caring for as many as 10,000 patients daily. Holy shit. The staff was still only 2,000. So they had a lot of reports of patient beatings A lot of reports of employees stealing. Hmm. A lot of unsanitary conditions. Oh, I cannot even imagine. And, of course, overcrowding. But really, that's like five patients per staff member. However, all those staff people aren't there. You know what I mean? Like, it's not. Mm -hmm. They're not there. All of them there all the time. And so, Mm -hmm. like, while the number doesn't sound like horrible horrible it is but well you know but like i said all the staff not there 24 7 and well some some of them them are probably fucking cooks and some of them are probably whatever you know yeah maintenance or whatever Mm -hmm. those are legit the two jobs i was gonna name really yes well one time there were 3800 mental patients who were crammed into their little quarters, and it was only designed for 2,500. And then, oh, throw in 300 patients with tuberculosis on top of that. And then there were 3,800 patients with tuberculosis because uh, Mm -hmm. that's how that shit spreads. Yeah. So at that point, there were like 125 women that had to share five toilets. Five. Mm -mm Mm-mm-mm. And we know how the dorms were, Mm -hmm. like, you know, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot more toilets than five. The problem with their overcrowded facilities was well documented. And in 1947, there's this picture of three female patients. And they're in the women's mental ward. And they are asleep on the floor of the admitting room because there's no more room anywhere else. And that's where they had to sleep. That place is a fucking powder keg. I mean, it is just waiting to explode. You've got people who are, again, overcrowding. So, you know, 
people are getting angry and you know the more angry I get don't fucking touch me so then when you have all those people on top of you Mm -hmm. then you're not sleeping because you're fucking sleeping on the floor and you know it's probably cold or hot and disgusting it's fucking Michigan so you know that shit gets cold as shit Mm -hmm. they're bored as fuck just finally got some occupational and some recreational therapy. So, I mean, that place is fucking just a ticking time bomb. I think, too, that this place, like, literally triggers all of my things. And so that's why I can, like, <laughs> yeah. feel the stress of the place. Like, yeah. they're bored, they're hot, they're in the house, bored, bored in the house, in the motherfucking house. Why do you have to say it? Because now she's going to be singing it and Will's going to have to cut 20 fucking times. <laughs> if y'all don't know, it's from TikTok. I created a monster. But, so, for real, for real, though. They're bored. They're hot. They're sleepy. They're uncomfortable. Ergo, they're grumpy. Ergo, don't touch me. But then, you got 700 extra people touching you. Yeah. No, thank you. Mm-mm. <laughs> no, thank you. Fast forward to 1960, and... There's now new theories, new practices, and everything for mental illness. And so it's no longer like, hey, let's keep them away from society. Mm -hmm. Let's provide long-term care. It's like, hey, we can, quote, unquote, cure these people. We can help them and return them to society and all of this. So a lot were kept less than 90 days. And that really hurt them because the state only paid for the psychiatric expenses if a patient has been hospitalized for a year. Oh. And so if they were only in there for 90 days or whatever. Then they weren't getting paid. Exactly. And if they that patient couldn't afford it. Then what were they going to do? Exactly. I will say that Eloise was one of the first hospitals to ever use x-rays for diagnosis And it became home to the first kidney dialysis unit in Michigan. Wow. Yeah. So not all bad. Yeah. But like I said, when I say something good, I have to follow it up with something bad. And this is just not bad. I mean, it's bad, but it's like, of course. So they tried this thing called mainstreaming, which was kind of like their hall passes and stuff again. Sounds like like an inclusion kind of thing. Yes. And so it was, like, getting them back into the community each week. But there was this one time it really caused a problem because this one patient was, like, super excited. Uh Uh-oh. And he was like, I get to go on a weekend trip. Kind of how I am with my ice cream and cake. Ice cream and cakey cake. Ice cream and cakey cake. Yes. Okay. Well, he stole a car from the hospital parking lot. Oh, shit. So then... Cut to a high-speed chase. Oh, shit. Then cut to five collisions that that caused. Double shit. And, oh, yeah, he ran through two police blockades. Then, during that whole chase, there were shots fired. Oh, shit. Mm, While there were a group of kids at a school crossing. Seems reasonable. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, he finally ran the car into a ditch and was taken into custody. Oh, well, he didn't die. He didn't die because Barney Fife was apparently shooting at him. Right. And I mean, did they not have the little, well, I almost call them the rumble strips, but the tire thing, tire tire spike thingies? I mean, boom, boom, they're out. (laughs) And we thought the road humps were bad on your tires. Right. But can you imagine that? He's like, I get to go for the weekend. Ooh, gotta go. Yeah. (laughs) And then like, (laughs) can't back out now. Poor guy. (laughs) <laughs> Meanwhile, they put him in custody. He's like, this isn't what y'all had in mind. <laughs> but I get to go out tomorrow, right? I just wanted the ice cream. <laughs> and cake. And cakey cake. Well, the last patient left Eloise in 1979, and it officially closed in 1981. Today, the hospital only has about eight buildings left, And a lot of them, like, the sites were closed, and then they were basically leveled. And then those portions that were cleared were sold to Ford Motor Company. Damn. And then another one was developed into an 18-hole golf course, strip mall, condominiums, all the things. So when you said, like, can you imagine how much that land would be worth? Like, can you imagine? 
What, Ford Motor Company had to pay for that? Shit. More money than I will ever know or even <laughs> comprehend in my lifetime. Right. Well, I mean, really, honestly, that's like $10,000 for me, but... That's the fucking truth. <laughs> All right. So now we're on to the hauntings. According to Haunted USA, there are some people who were at the location exploring and allegedly, I'm going to put this in all caps, allegedly found some jars that contained human body parts and some documents that like had some odd medical procedures on them, you know, like kind of like ads. They found some photographs of some patients and they said basically they were frightening. But I don't know if any of that is where you can see it, you know, because right. I mean, we're coming off of where my last story where they found all of this stuff and they still have some of that on display. So I feel like why don't they have that? So I don't know. Like that, again, allegedly. Well, and I want to know where they found it mm -hmm. because if they've sold off all this stuff, like why all of a sudden now are these people just randomly finding these, mm -hmm. like this treasure trove of like documents and pictures and yeah. Okay. Of course, people have seen lots of orbs and pictures and stuff. They've heard gurney sounds through the halls. They all have the feeling of being watched. And lots of people hear women humming. Hmm. Which, humming is, like, freaky. But if it was whistling, I'd be the fuck out of there. Mm, yeah, whistling's real weird. Mm -mm -mm. People have claimed to see a woman wearing white, and she's often seen on the upper floors or on the roof. They've heard moaning and screams, and it could be anywhere on the old grounds. And, you know, of course, they say those are the souls of the tormented mm -hmm. patients. Well, Jeff Adkins, who is a co-founder of the group Detroit Paranormal Expeditions, he had recently investigated the basement, and he said that he could hear, like, footsteps shuffling. And he said down there it was just, like, super eerie, and you got the sense that someone else was down there with you. And he said it was, like, hands down one of the, like, most eerie places that he's ever been. They also captured some EVPs, so I'm just going to, like, kind of tell you a little bit about them. They were walking through the power plant, and they were commenting about, like, they thought they saw a flashlight, and it says, who are you? Better fucking get out of here. Oh, shit. I'm like, is that me as a ghost? Then another time during an EVP session, one of the ladies of the crew said, are you crazy? And an EVP was captured that said, yeah, maybe. Damn. Damn. And then another lady had, like, commented that she was going to step out for a little bit, like, take a break. And then they said that about that time, they captured an EVP that said, lost, bitch. Shit. <laughs> like, damn. <laughs> Shots fired. Didn't know it was a fucking competition because I would have won if I'd have known. <laughs> Jeff had made comments about some sudden, like, back pain and stuff. And he said, like, the F word. And at that time, they got an EVP, and it said, don't say that. Damn. Mm -hmm. Who is it, my mama? Right. <laughs> and then another time, Jeff, he asked, like, if you're here, if you're present, I want you to say the word lobotomy. If you underwent a lobotomy here. And they had a geo box, which is... You know, where the whole, like, radio frequency stuff. Yeah. And it picked up lobotomy. Damn. One time around Halloween, there was this psychic medium. Her name's Brandy Marie. And she was on the third floor. And she said that she felt a presence just down the hall. She was with a group. And they were doing a geobox session. Well, just like a few seconds later, a vinyl record that was sitting on the top of the filing cabinet just shot off and then slammed on the floor hard enough that it broke. So it's like, it's not just a, 
oh, the wind knocked it off and it fell to the ground, it wouldn't have broke. But also, thanks, not gotta fucking sweep that shit up. Right. One of the building employees said that there was a couple of children that had came up to her and said that they were by a staircase and they like, you know, were talking, doing something and they turned around and they saw a guy was sitting on the steps and he had Bermuda shorts on and he was just sitting there. And so they saw him, but the employees didn't see him and She was like, I mean, we've seen shadows, but we didn't see, like, a person Mm -hmm. like these kids did. But I thought it was funny because you've asked, like, why are they always in Victorian era clothes? He had Bermuda shorts on. There you go. A present day ghost. (laughs) Shops at Old Navy. (laughs) Then Todd Bonner, the co-founder of Detroit Paranormal Expeditions, He had an odd encounter on the third floor. He said that he got separated from everyone else, and so he went to the command center and was just checking the cameras, talking to people on Facebook Live, and, well, he heard footsteps behind him, so he shined a flashlight and was like, hello, nothing. So he went back to doing what he was doing, and then he heard the footsteps again, but louder this time. But nothing ever came with it. And, you know, like, he shined the light again, nothing there. So he was like, I'm out. Well, they checked the audio back, and you could hear footsteps. You could hear objects being moved, like desk and just, like, heavy stuff. And there's nothing going on on the cameras. Wow. Yeah. Well, and, you know, like, with places like this, locals, they're always going to have their own, like, folklore and, you know, All of their stuff. You know, like if you ride by and you look in the third window, you could see whatever. Yeah. Well, they were like, there's a hidden graveyard on this property. Like everyone knew it, but it was hidden. Like, oh my gosh. Clearly not hidden very well if everybody knew about it. Well, a guy found it. Oh, well, that's why. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, like it really was hidden. But he unearthed it. What's sad is it was like a lot of them were, you know, you think about it, they were the poor, they were sick, no family to claim them. And so they were just buried here, you know, there could be like 7,000 graves. Wow. His first discovery was like a stone marker with the number 18 because there's no names But then he uncovered some more stones, and those were in the 3,000s. What? Mm Mm-hmm. The guy who found them, he was like, can we let these people have dignity? They didn't have anything in life. I mean, in death, they're just going to be left like this. What if it was your family? Wow. He worked and worked and worked, and he got it, along with other people, got it to be recognized as a cemetery. You know, so it's no longer a hidden cemetery. But just think about, like, all of that. You know, like, now they're working on trying to match up people and, you know, try to figure out who belongs to whom. Yeah. To just give some kind of closure to their souls. Yeah, absolutely. So I found this website. It's called michigan-hauntedhouses.com. And there's two experiences I wanted to talk about. This one lady said that in December of 2010 to March 2011, her and her kids stayed at a family shelter that was located next to Eloise in one of the old buildings. She said that she would see things all the time in the top two floors of the Eloise building. And things would pass by the windows or the lights would, you know, dim or flash or whatever. But then one afternoon, she walked into her room and her kids were at daycare and stuff. And so she got on her bed and then her son's soccer ball rolled out from under his bed, curved a little, and then stopped right before it got to her. And so she tried to make it again, like, okay, this is probably how it happened. Yeah, and like, was slanted. Uh-huh, it wouldn't. And so she's like, okay, I'm still going to get this nap, but okay. Another time, 
she said it was like around nine and all of the people who were grown-ups that stayed in the shelter had chores to do. So all the kids would sleep and they could not come out of their rooms while it was being done. Well, her chore was bleaching the toilets and the stalls in the women's bathroom. So one night she walked into the bathroom and she saw the door on the first stall that was shut. So she was like, all right, time to finish up. Go to your room so I can start my chore. Well, after she said that, the stall door opened and no one came out. Wow. So she walked over to it and no one was there. So she said that she left that bathroom, did not go back until the other two girls who did the bathrooms came in too. Other families that lived there said that they heard kids running and laughing at like two and three in the morning. And obviously, like, no one was allowed to do that. Convenient time. Mm hmm. And some of the maintenance men said in the basement, the radio would turn on and off by itself. And then there would be knocking on the delivery door in the basement. Nothing there. And then she said her friend had a daughter who was like four years old. And she would talk to a lady who was at the window at night. Wow. Mm Mm-hmm. And so when they ask her, like, okay, so what does she look like, this lady? Yeah. And she said that she was in all white and she looked like a nurse. Hmm. So it's crazy that, you know, it could be a nurse from the psychiatric hospital. It could. Well, then another experience from that same website is a person who said they explored the Eloise in the 80s. And they were touched on their back and they heard like inaudible voices a lot of times. Well, they have tunnels and I didn't even really touch on this, but they had underground tunnels, of course, like to transport the deceased and also i mean anytime like with tuberculosis yeah and with you know 900 and something acres like you need how to get the food how to do whatever like they had tunnels underneath that they use for transporting okay well she was in the tunnel i'm sorry well this person was in the tunnels and they said that there was a rumor that at one point when the asylum was shut down a lot of the patients who were going to just be on the street or, you know, were some of those people who were like, life is too hectic. I can't go back. Yeah. They hid out in the tunnels and lived there instead. So that person said they don't know if they experienced patients, but they did come across someone in the tunnels. And every time they would hear like faint laughs When they were in the tunnels, and one time the flashlight went dark for just mere seconds, but of course it seems like forever. Right. But when it came back on, they could make out a shape that was just outside the reach of the light. But the closer they got, the shape would still just be out of the reach of the light. And so then it was like, hey, wait, I keep following this, and... I can't get closer. Like, yeah. what? what is it leading me to? I need to turn around, you know? Yeah. Well, right when they turned around, the laugh started to <gasps> laugh again. No. Uh-huh. And so then they had that feeling of someone following them. mm Well, there was someone there. What? Who was it? Tell me. <laughs> it was this man. And he was laughing in a low tone. Had kind of like the crazy look in his eye. And he never really ran towards this person. Stayed about, you know, 15 feet Mm -hmm. until, like, they reached the, like, entrance exit of the tunnel where they had came in at. And they looked back and he was gone. Wow. So they're like, was he a patient? Was he homeless? I don't know. But I'm not going back to find out. Wow. Wow. And that is all I have. Man, when a place has all of that cumulative trauma, like, mm-hmm. that is inevitable. Yeah. The hauntings. Like, even if it's just, I mean, you know, I don't know shit about this shit. <laughs> but even if it's just, like, residual haunting or whatever that is when it's not really there, but it's there because it's, but it's not really there. <laughs> because, like, their soul, whatever it's called. That, like, it's bound to happen 
when you have so much trauma. So much trauma, so much emotional turmoil, anguish, everything. I mean, beginning with the poorhouse at the very start where those people did not want to be there but were transferred. Yeah, because they were in a place called the poorhouse. I know. I mean, can we get some like, I mean, government subsidized housing or some shit like that? Like Now we got HUD. But you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, oh, you in the poorhouse? Okay, cool. I know. Like, what the fuck? I know. We've gotten more PC. And, I mean, that's, you know, that's with your story. But even with my story, I mean, if the story is even a little bit how she said it was, even if it really was self-defense, it potentially was the trauma coming back. And, you know, it's like almost like it was like it unleashed onto him. Yeah. It's just interesting to see how the emotional blowback, for lack of a better word, is attached to all these events that happen on an individual level, but then also on a more township type level with yeah. Eloise's place. Yeah. Well, I think you summed it all up. Well, okay. I guess there's only one more thing to do. Remember. Creep it real and, and don't, don't get, get scared. scared.